And I'm Ruslan Nikolaev, research assistant professor from Virginia Tech. And my today's talk uh, is weight free memory reclamation and data structures. Uh, as Neil mentioned, I've worked in industry and currently worked and currently work in Virginia Tech and uh, have re several research publications in SOSP, VE, POTC, DISC, and PPOP. And today's talk partially overlaps with my recent PPOP 2020 publication, uh, which is titled as Universal Weight Free Memory Reclamation. And this publication was co authored with Professor Benoit Ramendran, who I'm, work uh, who I'm, who I'm working with. Um, he is also from Virginia Tech. So what are, what are the concurrent data structures? Uh, well, many core systems today require efficient access to data. And concurrent data structure provide a natural way to achieve fast performance uh, for many core systems. Uh, concurrent data structures put uh, specific properties uh, of how we need to, uh, how thread need to manipulate data structure. So one, thread, uh, one property is safety. So multiple threads need to safely manipulate data structure. Uh, and this is very similar to ordinary sequential data structures. And that basically means that nothing bad will happen. So thread will do, uh, each thread will do some work uh, and the data structure will not be corrupted. Uh, but concurrency also adds uh, another property which is called liveness property. And that property uh, describes how thread will be able to make progress. So in other words, this property sometime uh, can be described as something good will happen eventually. For example, uh, one thread, we can say that at least one thread will make some progress. Uh, so one particular type of concurrent data structures is known as non-blocking data structures. And uh, there, are, there are several subtypes of non-blocking data structures uh, which uh, provide different progress guarantees. Uh, one subtype is abstraction-free uh, uh, data structures in which a thread performs an operation in a finite number of steps uh, as long as other threads don't interfere and uh, basically run in, uh, this thread can be run in isolation from other threads. Uh, there is also log-free progress guarantee uh, in which um, at least one thread always make a uh, progress in a finite number of steps. And finally, weight-free progress guarantee uh, basically stipulates that all threads will make progress in a finite number of steps. And unsurprisingly, weight freedom is the most complex and uh, uh, progress guarantee because it's also the strongest form of progress guarantee. And uh, historically, weight freedom was uh, not that important in practice. Uh, and for several reasons, because one, one reason was that data structures uh, were slower than log-free uh, counterparts or uh, they were very tedious to implement. But more recently, they're gaining more practical relevance, uh, for example, uh, when using Kogan and Fitrank fast path methodology that was described in PPOP 2012. Um, and because they provide uh, strict latency guarantees they also become more and more important in practice. So another thing to note is that uh, typically non-blocking data structures are implemented using compare and swap, and it's used universally by log-free and weight-free algorithms. And there is also sometimes uh, specialized instructions such as fetch and dead, uh, which certain architectures such as x86-64 or ARM64 implement, uh, and they uh, can also be used in certain cases because they provide uh, more efficient performance. Um, so, uh, uh, so, uh, let's, uh, so what is the memory reclamation problem? So the memory and memory reclamation problem uh, basically is defined as follows. Uh, one thread wants to deallocate a memory block uh, which is still reachable by concurrent threads. For example, thread B tries to deallocate a block reference by pointer P. So in the meantime, uh, thread A and thread C try to dereference pointer P. 
and uh, this pointer uh, can is still reachable because this pointer is still reachable by concurrent threads. And naturally, what happens is that program crashes, so uh, you get a sec fault. So uh, probably uh, before we get started to the memory reclamation problem uh, and describe it in more detail. Uh, let's take a look at a very simple data structure, which um, most of you are, which is called tribal log free stack. Tribal log free stack is effectively a sort of linked list, uh, I, I should say a singly uh, linked list, uh, which is keeping an object as part of the nodes. So for example, uh, we have node one, node two, and node three, uh, which are linked together. And each of these nodes have a, a reference to an object. So, and we also have a pointer to the top of the stack, which is effectively at the beginning of this list. So, and push and pop operation for the stack are implemented using uh, CAS on the top uh, variable. For example, we insert a new element and uh, top becomes points to uh, uh, node number four. So uh, this is our node data structure. We have a pointer to the next element. We have an object which we store inside the node, and then we have a pointer to the top of the stack. So push operation is pretty simple. We allocate a node, uh, we store an object, and then in a loop, try to do CAS, uh, basically updating to a pointer. If it fails, we repeat and so on. Um, so similar, we have pop operation. Uh, we try to retrieve an object. We first uh, read, we in a loop, we try to read the top pointer, then we uh, try to update top pointer to the next element. And if it succeeds, uh, we basically can delete an, uh, the just retrieved node and then we can just return an object. So clearly the problem is that we cannot just simply delete this node, right? So because some concurrent threads can still access uh, this node and we want to make sure that uh, those threads uh, will not crash. So one way we can do that, if we don't need to return memory to S, we can simply recycle elements. And this is the simplest approach. Uh, and uh, this simple data structure such as driver's log free stack, it's very easily, we can easily do that. Uh, but we have to keep in mind that when we recycle nodes, um, let's say we create some separate stack, uh, which we would call free stack, and we will just maintain a list of free nodes, right? But if you do so, we need to make uh, to keep in mind that uh, when we recycle the same node, it will have the same pointer. And what may happen is that some thread will erroneously succeed on some sort of cast operation just because some point I happen to have the same value. And this problem is known as the ABA problem. And if you don't do anything, it will lead to the data structure corruption. However, this problem can be easily solved by using a tag, uh, which can be placed adjacent to the pointer to the, uh, which we store in the uh, top pointer, right? And we will increment each time. And therefore the tag will uniquely identify an object. If, since we need to uh, do that, we, uh, we also need to use dub white cas, uh, which will store adjacent pointer and adjacent tag together. And this is available on x86-64 when we use compare and exchange 16 bytes. So going back to our example, uh, we can see that uh, we, have, uh, we have basically push and pop operation. And what was changed uh, is that uh, we have tag, uh, and then in push operation, we, uh, we will basically try to increment it by one. And similarly, we'll do the same thing in pop when we update a top pointer. And the top pointer uh, is initially a null pointer and as well as tag equals to zero. So once we insert new element, it will be one, second element two and so on, right? So the tag will effectively, as long as it doesn't overflow, it will uh, uniquely identify the object. 
So, but this is really a simple solution and probably it's not that great if you, uh, if you, uh, because you may need to return uh, memory to the operating system and you basically need to, uh, a more general solution. And a more general, in a more general solution, we basically want to postpone the allocation of the memory block until it's safe to do so. Um, but one thing to keep in mind, we cannot just postpone the allocation of the memory block uh, indefinitely, right? Because if you do so, then uh, memory usage may become unbounded. And uh, that effectively is the point of memory reclamation that we keep memory usage bounded. So we reclaim memory timely and uh, as quickly as possible, right? Uh, and moreover, if the memory usage becomes unbounded, uh, that would violate non-blocking progress guarantees. Um, because if, let's say, we uh, run out of memory, which may, still, which may easily happen if you never reclaim memory, uh, then your program will crash or you'll have to wait until memory is uh, cleaned up. So therefore, we can no longer say that this is non-blocking, right? So this will be blocking. And weight-free mem uh, weight memory reclamation is especially difficult uh, because uh, it puts extra requirements uh, on top of that. And no universal weight-free memory reclamation uh, until recently existed for handcrafted data structures. Uh, it's also important to note that uh, methodologies such as PPOP 2012 that I mentioned, uh, which can be used for data structures uh, to make them weight-free, they're not easily applicable to, to the memory reclamation itself uh, because we have to, uh, uh, we, we, because it basically has some implicit assumption on memory reclamation uh, uh, itself. So therefore, uh, it's not directly applicable. Um, so uh, uh, do we have any questions so far, Nail? Actually, no, everything is clear, everything's okay. Go ahead, please. Okay. Um, there are several solutions to the memory reclamation problem, uh, and one of the com one of the most popular solution is uh, so-called epoch-based reclamation. Uh, in the epoch in the epoch-based reclamation, we use a global epoch counter. It's also sometimes known as an error. Uh, uh, basically, error and epoch is pretty much the same thing. Um, and uh, the idea is that. Uh, we have a so-called so reservation in each thread, uh, and this reservation can be accessed by any uh, other thread, uh, and we uh, maintain some so sort of, we keep a, an epoch inside this reservation. And many variations of epoch-based reclamation exist. Uh, they differ on how we increment epoch counter. Uh, there is conditional increments, unconditional, and when we trigger memory reclamation, for example, the original epoch-based reclamation, which was described by uh, Kyle Fraser, uh, required only three distinct epoch values, uh, but there are also different other variations. Uh, just as an example, consider a variant with unconditional epoch increment uh, that was presented in PPOP 2018. Um, so we have uh, the global epoch counter, which, uh, which is set to two, and then we have a reservation for each thread. Uh, we have four threads, and thread one and thread three are active. They have some uh, valid epoch counters, whereas three, thread two and four are currently not active. Uh, for them, the epoch value is infinity. So in epoch-based reclamation, each data structure operation uh, must be wrapped. So when we begin an operation, uh, a thread to uh, this per thread reservation. And when we end, uh, when we end that operation, uh, the thread needs to reset its reservation. So in other words, uh, when we begin an operation, uh, we flip from infinity to let's say epoch two, if as long as ep global epoch was two, uh, epoch value will become two. And then we have end operation, we reset it to infinity. So it goes from two to infinity. So the idea then is that when we delete objects, we don't actually delete them right away. Instead, we use a proce uh, process which is called uh, retiring. So we retire memory block, uh, and the idea is that we uh, 
that uh, this memory block is no longer reachable from the data structures. Uh, only a uh, concurrent thread can still access it. And when all these concurrent threads are done, this memory block can be finally deleted. Uh, so we store, uh, for that purpose, we store a global epoch uh, counter at the moment of retiring. Uh, it's so-called retire epoch and place the retire block in, in the thread local list. So periodically, uh, we will increment epoch counter, uh, for example, when we retire, right? And then we also periodically will scan previously retired bro blocks from the uh, thread local list to see which blocks can be finally deallocated. Uh, so the block can be deallocated if the, its epoch is already behind all, reserv uh, all reservation values across all threads. So for example, let's say, let's say we want to retire a new node, the global epoch value is two, uh, so retire epoch becomes two. Uh, we, inserted, uh, we insert this uh, node to the top of the list. Uh, this list already has some previously retired nodes. And uh, in that uh, thread three, for example, scans this list at some point. And then uh, we detect that retire, uh, retire epoch zero can already be deleted. And the reason for that is because all reservations, uh, the minimum reservation that we have is a one, right? And this is zero, so we can finally delete uh, epoch zero. So when it become, when a thread one exits, at that point, the minimum epoch will be two and we can safely uh, uh, delete a, a node with the retire epoch one. So in summary, EBR tracks memory using so-called epochs, right? And the idea is that uh, it's re really kind of simple API. The only thing that we need to wrap some uh, uh, data structure operations, but that's not really a big deal typically. Uh, it's also very fast, uh, especially uh, if you find a good balance of how frequently we increment epoch and how frequently we scan a uh, list of previously retired nodes. But one important thing that this scheme is blocking, uh, and because we potentially may have a, uh, an unbounded memory usage. So for example, if one thread is stuck uh, and never calls end op, we may have an unbounded number of blocks. So for example, if thread one is stuck, uh, we would have epoch one stuck forever basically. And uh, no matter what, no matter what the global epoch value is, we will not be able to clean up our lists. So we'll basically uh, hold an unbounded number of memory blocks. And eventually, in the worst case scenario, if this thread is really gone for good and doesn't really come back anytime soon, uh, you have an, uh, you can easily exhaust memory, and at that point, the program will probably crash. Um, so this is, uh, I mean, in certain cases, this can be acceptable, but, you know, this is not also something that we want to have, right? So we re really want to have a stable program which doesn't crash and doesn't use too much memory. So to that end, some other schemes were proposed, and one of the uh, common scheme uh, is called hazard pointers. It was originally published in TPDS 2004, uh, the, the idea is that uh, we will keep in reservation pointers rather than epochs and uh, basically uh, because each thread also can, uh, uh, each thread, and, and when, whenever we want to access some memory block, we will wrap this uh, operation in so-called, uh, in a special method, uh, which would allow us to safely dereference a pointer. Um, and since a thread may, uh, uh, may reserve multiple pointers, we may need several reservations per each thread. Uh, so an index, a special index, will identify a specific reservation that this thread wants to use. So similarly, when we retire a block, we will put it in the thread local list and periodically scan the list to check where, if any of the retired block uh, can be finally deleted. Uh, that 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 is tr uh, that can happen when none of the uh, none of the pointers overlaps with the uh, reservation across all threads, and then then we deallocate such blocks. 
Again, the uh, probably the trade-off would be how frequently we scan this list, and uh, if you don't scan it too frequently, we'll probably have uh, bigger memory usage. But if you scan it too frequently, uh, we will uh, we will also uh, have more cost per 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 each retire operation. So just as an example, how we how would we uh, how we would use hazard pointers with our log free stack. So for each node in our log free stack, we'll have to incorporate a special reclamation header um, uh, that can be just a pointer for a thread local list, uh, and this is really private to the uh, to the memory reclamation scheme, uh, and it's up to memory reclamation scheme what it keeps there. Um, so then we have get protected method, which which wraps any pointer dereference. So for example, we need to dereference top pointer in pop. Uh, we use get protected, and we use index zero because it's the only basically pointer that we use uh, for this simple algorithm. And then um, uh, basically get protected will create a reservation uh, internally. Uh, when when we retire not we just call retire uh, and then uh, uh, retire basically when we retire we need to make sure that the data structure can no longer reach this node so it's only in flight thread can access it so we first uh, need to make sure that CAS succeeds and only after this we call retire um, and then finally clear operation uh, the clear operation resets all prior reservation that uh, which were made by get protected. Uh, so we may have multiple reservation uh, in general. So here we just have uh, index zero, but in general there might be more indices. So clear uh, will uh, reset all of them um, and get protected itself. Uh, when we repeat a loop, it will erase the previous reservation and set a new reservation. So the idea is that hazard pointers. Uh, the idea of hazard pointers is that it tracks memory using pointers. And it's log free in general. And in certain cases, it can be used in weight free manner, uh, but you know, more generally, it's still log free. Typically, it's much slower than uh, EBR. And why is that? The reason for that is that get protected uh, here, uh, we'll have to basically issue some sort of memory fence because we need to. Uh, to advertise this pointer, to store uh, to store this pointer inside the reservation, and we need a memory fence. And if we have to call get protected frequently, uh, then we will have a significant cost because, especially if it's some read uh, intensive data structure, which only needs to dereference some pointer, but as a result of get protected, we issue some memory fence. That's not something that probably developer expects. Uh, because uh, reading should be uh, fast, but in this case, it would not be that fast. So to that end, uh, researchers propose to combine uh, EBR and hazard pointers. So one way is to use epochs, or sometimes called errors, for reservations as an EBR, uh, and let's say it's going to be a complete 64-bit values. Um, and then we will drop all pointer references as in hazard pointers. So we will use some sort of method, method like get protected, uh, which, was, which was not present in EBR, but was present in hazard pointers. Additionally, when allocating block, blocks, we will initialize the global epoch value and we'll store it. And therefore, each block will record an interval. Uh, it will not only have retire epoch, but it will also have an allocation epoch. And this interval will basically determine the lifetime of this block. Uh, to safely delete the memory block, this interval must not overlap across all reservations. Uh, so there, uh, there are different algorithms uh, that implement this idea. Hazard errors, which was uh, published in SPA 2017, uh, provides API which is really mostly compatible with hazard pointers, uh, except a very minor case when we just allocate memory blocks and we need to wrap a malloc, uh, uh, we additionally need to wrap a malloc. And generally it's much faster than hazard pointers uh, because we don't need to issue memory fence uh, 
each time that we call get protected. So there is a way to amortize this cost. And there is also interval-based interval reclamation report 2018. Uh, the difference is that it provides uh, simpler EBR-like API. It doesn't require this kind of indices like in get protected. It still requires to wrap pointers, uh, but it's still easier to use. But one downside is that it needs to be modified. Uh, data structures need to be modified so that uh, we restart operation for starting threads. It turns out that hazard errors, unlike hazard pointers, can be further modified to guarantee weight freedom. Um, and this is exactly what uh, our recent weight free errors paper in PIPOP 2020 do. Uh, it, it's basically based on hazard errors, but uh, it also provides uh, strong weight freedom guarantees. So hazard errors is slightly, uh, as I mentioned, slightly different from hazard pointers. We need to uh, wrap uh, malloc for, for instance, in push in the push operation, we would replace malloc with alloc block and uh, alloc block allocates an initializer memory block. It will basically store the allocation epoch uh, in, inside the reclamation header. Um, so there are also some other schemes uh, but they are not always uh, applicable and they may be, uh, especially if you use some low level programming models. For example, there are some schemes based on log free garbage co collection, uh, which, is, uh, which is great uh, and very convenient, but it's not always suitable for C++ because the, we don't necessarily want to use garbage collection in C++. And this is especially true if you want to do some low-level kernel programming uh, where garbage collection is really not uh, typically acceptable. Um, we, where, where we want to have full control of what's going on and how we allocate and deallocate memory. So there is also some schemes that rely on certain OS primitives and mechanisms like OS scheduler or signal mechanisms uh, like QSense and Debra Plus. And they can be very convenient for user space programs, but still problematic for kernel space code where we have to attain strict non-blocking guarantees while avoiding you know, the special OS primitives. And one other thing to note is that um, uh, we can also argue that since they rely on OS mechanisms such as a scheduler or a signal handler, and those mechanisms typically use locks, and uh, therefore maybe overall, they also don't provide strict non-blocking guarantees because of that. So in fact, the API itself is very important for non-blocking progress guarantees. As I mentioned that inter interval-based reclamation API is very similar to EBR, uh, except that it additionally need to wrap pointer dereferences, but it's still uh, simpler than uh, the one that is used in hazard errors. Uh, but the problem is it's, uh, it's, it's not memory bounded. So when we have starring threads and we don't do anything uh, additionally in our data structure, um, we may basically still uh, reserve an unbounded, uh, unbounded amount of memory and then the program may still crash. So one way to address this problem is to uh, restart an operation and, and make uh, as long as you can do that in your data structure. Uh, it's still relatively simple because this, uh, because this pointer dereference can be easily hidden in smart pointers, uh, which is, you know, really much harder to do with hazard pointers or hazard errors. Um, so the hazard pointer, the hazard errors and uh, weight-free errors API are based on hazard pointers API, and the unique advantage of hazard pointers API is that it's specifically designed to make sure that a finite number of blocks are reserved. So we we have these indices and we have them for a good reason because they really guarantee that only a certain amount of memory is reserved and we have a, a clear theoretical bound of that. So do we have any questions so far? Yeah, thank you, Ruslan. We have a few questions and I would like to come back to you to the moment when you compared a few algorithms and a question from Valeri. How do you compare RSU containers to the hazard point and errors? So how do we compare RSU uh, with Earth. hazard point, uh, hazard pointers and, and what? Errors. Oh, hazard errors, right? So yes. RSU, RSU is, 
you know, RSC doesn't really provide uh, a strict on blocking guarantees and, you know, it's uh, uh, basically more probably comparable with epoch-based reclamation. Uh, so typically when we use RSU, there are some restrictions. We cannot really preempt a thread, uh, you know, for, for exactly this. I mean, this is one of the reasons why we don't want to do that, right? Because if you preempt the thread and if it never comes back, uh, then, you know, then we have un un unbounded memory usage. So it's really can be used in certain cases like Linux, uh, like the Linux kernel, right? As long as you follow this uh, specific programming uh, model that Linux describes, so you have some certain restrictions, as long as you follow that, you should probably be okay, but uh, it's non, it's still, as if you consider it in general, it's really not, it's still, it's still blocking. And besides that, I, I think there is really no direct comparison because uh, we are talking about log-free data structures or weight-free da data structures. And I guess R RSU will have some sort of different semantics. For instance, if you implement linked list, uh, it will probably have a different semantics uh, from uh, corresponding implementation, uh, like lo corresponding log-free implementation. Yeah, thank you. And the next question regarding epoch-based epoch, epoch reclamation. And question from Arseni. Isn't it true that epoch-based reclamation still need fences? Yeah, true. Uh, uh, so there are some optimizations, as far as I know, there is in certain cases, there is some certain uh, hacks that you can do. Uh, but in general, uh, when you begin an operation and end operation, when you basically store this epic value, you need a memory fence. Yeah, okay, thank you. Everything is clear, go ahead, please. Okay, thanks. Um, uh, let me go back to that slide. Okay. So going back to weight freedom, um, we know that there is a uh, there is a specific challenge for for achieving weight free reclamation. Uh, if you look at hazard errors, it's already log free, uh, but uh, moreover, it's uh, actually weight free for certain methods such as uh, I mean, uh, alloc block as long as your memory allocated is weight free, that should be fine. Uh, a retire method uh, the, uh, retire is also weight free. Clear is also weight free, but one thing that is not weight free is get protected. Is actually when we try to uh, do reference pointers. Um, so, and the reason why it's not uh, weight free is that we may have a potential unbounded loop. In hazard errors, we have a global error counter. So, and the idea is that when we retrieve uh, some pointer and get protected, we read the global error value. Uh, store epic error, error in reservation and then check uh, if the error is still the same. And if the error is still the same, uh, we converge, right, and exit. But what happens is that uh, some other thread uh, may increment error, right? So, so like, for example, we have retire method uh, run by some, uh, which is executed by some other thread, and this retire method calls increment error, and increment error is basically fetch and dead on global error. So if a global error keeps changing, uh, we may potentially never converge in that other thread. So we still have global progress. So some thread will make progress. So it's still log free, uh, but there is no guarantee that this specific thread will ever converge, at least theoretically speaking. Maybe in practice, that's not uh, very frequent, but you know, st still it's a possibility, right? If you have a specific execution pattern, uh, this may uh, happen that this thread will never exit from this loop. So clearly, the, we somehow we need to address this problem if you want to achieve true weight freedom. Uh, there is also uh, what's important to, uh, to note that it's still possible to achieve weight freedom in certain cases. And one, uh, uh, one specific case is uh, when we use TeamNet and Trunks formulation, uh, that is PPOP 2014, uh, and this, uh, this paper basically proposed a method to automatically convert log-free data structures uh, to weight-free uh, ones. So, and the idea is that uh, the original log-free data structures uh, needs to be written in so-called normalized form. 
so there are specific requirements uh, for this normalized form which are described in this publication. Uh, and among all those requirements, there is also one, uh, one requirement that any modification of the shared data structures uh, needs to be executed using a CAS operation. So we really, uh, as long as we have CAS and also follow other requirements that describe there, we can, uh, uh, we can convert this data structure to a weight-free one and uh, operations can fundamentally be restarted if things go wrong and therefore we don't really uh, need to make get protected unbounded. We can potentially bail out at some point, you know, and there's some ways to do that. Uh, so examples include, for example, uh, CR Turn Cure and Kogan Petran Cure implemented through hazard pointers. And that was PIP of 2017 publication. Um, so it's still possible to achieve weight freedom, uh, but it's really uh, uh, in, if you have specific formulation. And, you know, there is, it's much harder to still do that in a more general arbitrary formulated weight-free data structures. And one reason is that we may want to use specialized instruction, instructions such as fetch and dead, and they're really useful for weight-free data structures. In, in fact, hazard errors itself uses fetch and dead to implement global error. And as long as it's implemented in hardware that's also weight-free, uh, that scales very well, why not use it? So, and not only that, even if you have just CAS on the weight-free data structure, but it doesn't, it's not necessarily derived from this normalized form, and therefore it's still, uh, it's still not straightforward uh, how we can use it and how we can use it in a weight-free manner. So our recent PPOP 2020 uh, publication, which is uh, described, which described weight-free errors, solve weight-free memory reclamation for this more general case. So we really can use it uh, almost everywhere. So the idea is that we use uh, fast path, slow path method uh, for get protected. So it will try to first execute a uh, log-free version of get protected, but if uh, fails to converge after a certain number of iterations, we bail out and go to a slow path. And then uh, uh, because uh, retire increments the global error or alternatively alloc blocks may also uh, increment global error, it needs to call a helper method uh, uh, to basically help the thread stack and get protected before it goes and increments uh, the error clock. And um, uh, one uh, key idea is that in weight-free errors, uh, we achieve weight-free consensus with the help of specialized instructions such as fetch and dead. Uh, so we require that fetch and dead is implemented in hardware. We also need white cast. Uh, both of these instructions uh, should be available on modern x86-64 and ARM-64 architectures. Uh, if you don't have them, you can always bail out to hazard errors, uh, but that would only give you log freedom. Um, but it's, it's st still a backup option. Um, so in weight-free errors, so we start uh, with get protected fast method, then we go to the slow method. And in slow method, we request help uh, through a special per-thread state. Um, and then finally, we gather output. So the special per-thread state maintains multiple things, and one of the still this result. Um, so result will keep the both input or when we request help, as well as output when the uh, result is produced by a helper method. So the helper method comes from the increment error uh, so the, we need to scan. Uh, we, we need to scan all state entries for all threads. We find some thread needs help. We call help thread for this uh, for this uh, specific thread. And only after we are done uh, with all threads, we go and increment global error. So this way, we guarantee that either get protected uh, slow succeeds uh, or uh, our helper thread succeeds. One way or the other, uh, we produce result for this uh, thread which is, start, which is stuck and get protected. So in weight-free errors, uh, we introduce tags. And the tags are necessary to identify slow path uh, cycles. So whenever we take a slow path, we need to increment a tag. Uh, and tags are very similar to what I mentioned in the beginning uh, uh, to solve the ADA problem when we store tag, which is adjacent to a pointer, and this way we kind of uh, uh, prevent
and spurious CAS updates. So the idea here is also the same. Uh, even though it's not exactly used for this purpose, uh, the idea is still the same. We, they, we want to prevent spurious updates. We want to prevent spurious CAS uh, operations. And they will happen if, for example, we have uh, uh, one, uh, one thread executing a helper method for some old cycle, and maybe this thread already moved on, uh, you know, a result is already produced by somebody else, and we don't really need any help anymore. So we really want to prevent any spurious updates which comes after that. And tag will uniquely identify uh, slow path cycles. Uh, so to that end, we use result, as I mentioned, and result uh, is used for both input and output. Uh, so it will contain basically a pair, uh, A and B. Uh, so for input, we will store a slow path tag, which will identify the cycle. And for output, uh, we will uh, store block pointer, which we dereferenced for get protected, as well as the error that needs to be set in the reservation array. Um, in addition, we have two, uh, two additional reservations for helpers. I will get to that in a moment. Uh, so instead of uh, having a max indices, we will have max plus two indices, and max and max plus one are reserved for the helper thread. So, uh, for example, consider get protected slow. It's very similar to get protected. Uh, the only difference is that we also require an additional argument, uh, which is called block parent. And the parent is basically just describes an area where the, the pointer uh, needs to be dereferenced. For example, we have a linked list. Uh, we want to read next pointer. So we will basically, uh, the parent will be the current node and the next pointer will be the reference to the actual pointer, right? So the area is the actual node, um, which is itself uh, a reclamation unit for the mem reclamation algorithm. So we, we need this block so that we can retrieve an allocation error from that uh, block. And we uh, transfer this allocation error as well as the pointer that needs to be dereferenced from the, through the state array. So uh, on the input, we will record a, a tag. So we will record the, uh, the actual sl current slow path cycle. And uh, to distinguish input and outputs, uh, we reserve a special invalid pointer, uh, which can be just minus one. Uh, and as long as it's not something that is used by the data structure itself. For example, null pointer would probably not be a good idea because null pointer can be used by the data structure itself. So we reserve a special value which will basically distinguish between input and output so that we can distinguish between the case where the tag is stored or the, uh, the, the case where, uh, where we have store a point and an error. So on input, we have invalid point and tag. Uh, then we try to basically retrieve a point in a loop. So we still do the same thing as we would do in the fast path. We still try, the spread still keeps trying to uh, dereference this point in a loop. And then finally, uh, in each iteration, it will check the result. And uh, if the result is produced by, uh, by some thread, it will terminate the loop. Uh, it will just increment the tag uh, in reservation array and so on, right? And then we will exit. The helper uh, thread uh, basically retrieves the error that we stored in the state array as well as the, uh, as well as the tag. Um, so here the idea is that uh, we want to reserve the parent object so that it's not, rec it's not reclaimed. And for that reason, we need to set the error for the parent object uh, in uh, the special reservation array, uh, which is max. Um, so we retrieve, the, uh, we retrieve the error and set it uh, here. Then uh, basically we just also repeat the loop in a similar way that we did in get protected slow. Uh, the only difference here that we would, uh, rather than using, uh, rather than using the specific reservation identified by get protected, we use our special reservation, which is max plus one. Uh, and other than this, as long as we can produce a result, we just uh, exit and bail out from this loop. So when everything is done, uh, max plus one uh, reservation is reset to infinity, as well as max uh, reservation is also reset to infinity. So those are two special reservations that we need 
and they are only needed by the help of red. So one thing to note is that uh, we also need to avoid race condition and more details about that you can find in the paper. Uh, but basically the idea is that uh, when we want to scan deleted nodes, we don't want to just scan reservations once. We want to scan it once, but then we want to check special reservations and then we want to re repeat uh, again and check those reservations again. And the reason for that is because help of Fred may hand over a reservation uh, to, to, the, to the thread that it tries to help to, right? So, and therefore, there might be a small window for race conditions and we want to avoid that. So we evaluated uh, different, uh, different schemes and uh, I'm gonna get in a moment uh, to the results. Uh, so we use a test bed of, uh, of, uh, of uh, four CPUs, each CPU has uh, 24 cores. So in total, we have 96 cores. Uh, we have 256 gigabyte of RAM and we have GCC 8.3 or with maximum optimization. And we basically use uh, the benchmark from PPOP 2018 and compare, uh, compare weight-free errors, hazard errors, interval-based reclamation, epoch-based reclamation, hazard pointers, and also a special case when we don't really do any reclamation, just leak memory. Uh, so this is just the baseline. It doesn't have to be uh, very precise, but it just gives a theoretical bound, something that we can keep in mind, uh, how potentially good the memory reclamation can be, right? And uh, we use, we present results for write intensive workloads, such as 50% of insert operations, 50% of delete operations. There are also additional results in the paper uh, for read mostly operations, uh, but then, also quite similar. Uh, so one example is uh, Kogan and Petrank weight free Q. Uh, and you can see that all schemes are more or less on the same page. Uh, hazard errors, uh, IBR, weight free errors, or epoch based reclamation, they all provide pretty much similar performance, uh, uh, except that hazard pointers uh, actually have worse performance but not that bad, it's still, hazard point is still okay. Uh, and one advantage maybe hazard point is that it provides uh, very good memory utilization, which you can see uh, on, the, uh, on the second chart. Um, so you can see that hazard point is really good for memory utilization. Uh, but still weight free errors, hazard errors are still good for memory utilization. And uh, this is still um, most, most of the time is acceptable. Uh, so we test up to 120 threads, uh, but there is nothing uh, special here after 96 cores, uh, after 96 threads, uh, which would basically keep all cores busy. Uh, for this test, we don't see anything interesting here. So we have another test, uh, CR tone weight free Q. Uh, results are very similar to the uh, Kogan and Trunk Q, uh, except that performance is a little, it's a little faster, but uh, overall the trends are pretty much the same. Um, then we have a uh, sorted log-free link list. Uh, this is very uh, well-known data structure, Karis link list. Uh, you can see that, again, most of the schemes are on the same page, except hazard pointers, which is kind of slow, right? And the reason is because you really need memory fence uh, for each get protected operation. Um, then we have log-free hash map, uh, where the gap is actually even bigger. Uh, still pretty reasonable performance, although uh, with no reclamation, we can see there is uh, potentially maybe there is a way to increase performance, but even epoch-based reclamation doesn't get uh, that far. And uh, weight-free errors and hazard errors, IBR are pretty much close to EBR still. And one thing to note here is that after 96 threads, uh, we see how memory consumption really increases for epoch-based reclamation. It just skyrockets, right? And the reason for that is that uh, at that point, we have some preempted threads. Uh, yeah, it's, the schedule is still, uh, as long as the schedule is still fair, probably we'll get, get back to this thread sooner or later. But before we get back to those threads, we'll already accumulate a lot of uh, deleted nodes and we don't reclaim them timely. So this is uh, also emphasizes uh, 
like why uh, why it's important to bound memory usage. And you can see that for hazard errors or uh, IBR or uh, hazard pointers, memory utilization is much better. And the same result is for weight free errors, of course. Um, so somewhat similar trends we observe for log free and heterogen tree. Uh, the only difference is probably is throughput, but overall the trends are very much similar to hash map. So in conclusion, I want to say that concurrent data structure require careful consideration of the memory reclamation problem. And there is really several aspects that we need to take into account. And um, one of these important aspects is uh, to keep memory usage bounded. Uh, the role, that's the whole point of the memory reclamation scheme. Uh, and memory reclamation itself, uh, you know, definitely because of that becomes subject to progress guarantee requirements. So if you don't have a non, uh, if we, our memory reclamation scheme is blocking, then and we use it with some non-blocking data structures, then you can argue that overall progress that you get is still blocking. Um, so it really opens the way for wide adoption. Uh, our our weight-free schemes really opens the way for wide adoption for weight-free data structures. The only main obstacle is to how to do efficient uh, weight-free allocation and deallocation, because definitely GML that you use is not weight-free. It's not really uh, log-free for that matter, right? Uh, and but it's but this is really the first step, and you know this is really uh, we can if we can solve that problem as well, we are done, right? And that can really spur further research in weight-free reclamation. So you can find code. Uh, uh, you, first of all, you can find the paper on my personal website. Website there is also a VFE code published on my GitHub repository. So feel free to go and download this code. And if you have any questions, you can always email uh, to to my uh, VT address. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for a detailed and informed speech. I do believe my audience had has greatly benefited from it. I would like now to invite questions from floor. This may be typed in the chat for our guest to address. And just to refresh your memory, the link to the chat just under the video, the link to the Telegram chat. Uh, as I can see, there is no any specific question right now. And first question from me, and just to be clear, Weight-free errors algorithm is something that you personally discover, am I right? It's something that you created. Sorry, I missed the question. I apologize. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. Uh, there's no any specific question from chat. And the first question from me, and just to be clear, weight-free errors algorithm is something that you personally created. It is something that you discover, am I right? Yes, that's correct. So that is uh, uh, also appeared uh, recently in people of 2020. And that's something that I was thinking, you know, some long time. And, you know, then I, you know, realized, you know, we probably can do get protected in a weight free manner. But I have to acknowledge there is also some concurrent works, I think, uh, by uh, uh, like there was one file uh, uh, also was weight free, uh, which considered weight free reclamation in uh, a software transactional memory. Although VFE that uh, I presented here was kind of done independently from that and probably concurrently, uh, but uh, but there is also some concurrent work which considered uh, memory reclamation uh, pro problem in specifically for the software transactional memory context. But it's still different because this really considers for handcrafted data structures, whereas um, one file considers it for uh, for STMs. Yeah, I see. but but there uh, is some overlap because there is some uh, mechanisms are based on hazard errors, <laughs> so there is some overlap there. Um, Ruslan, are there any practical problems that you're trying to solve? Maybe that you can share if it's possible, if it's not sensitive. Yeah, it's not sensitive. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, I think one reason why I wanted to have this universal weight free reclamation is to have some more flexibility on how we design data structures. Because something that I'm recently looking at is how to use uh, weight free stru data structures 
how to design uh, weight free data structures and design them uh, using some specialized instructions and you know and where mm -hmm. uh, where like traditional maybe techniques would not be directly applicable and uh, I really want to kind of at least uh, solve this problem so that it's not really a, on the way to of creating a truly weight free data structure. Yeah, I see. Thank you. Um, the next question is in relation to what you mentioned on algorithms, can this be used in ARM processor and are there any problems related to this? You mentioned during the session a few times about ARM, but could you explain a little bit more details, a little bit more deeper? Yeah, so it can definitely be implemented in ARM. Uh, uh, there is probably one limitation is that uh, you need uh, hardware fetch and add, and that was only introduced uh, in ARM, uh, if I remember correctly, 8.1. So if you have 8.0 uh, ARM64, then you probably still don't have this instruction. And another thing to consider, maybe you want to have CAS uh, as opposed to LSC for true, for truly, uh, for true uh, progress guarantees, because LSC can sometimes fail sporadically. So for that reason, also I think 8.1 uh, uh, introduced CAS. Um, so basically, as long as you use uh, more recent ARM, you shouldn't have any problem. So because both these instructions are available there, and that already available for in x86-64, maybe except some early revisions of uh, of MD processors that you didn't implement compare and exchange 16 byte. But those are really old processors, and I guess all of uh, modern CPUs should have it. In fact, I think Windows 10 requires uh, that as a prerequisite for x86-64. Yeah. Um, you mentioned, I guess you mentioned about a uh, hardware transaction memory model, right? And that's become more popular last year. Is there any, uh, the question is, can uh, hardware transaction memory help to solve that issues or is there any comparison or is it maybe disadvantages? Yeah, I think when we get to practical implementation of hardware transactional memory, that becomes tricky, right? So be with respect to progress guarantees and uh, can we really have this uh, like uh, weight free progress guarantees there, right? So and the answer is probably not. And, uh, you know, and uh, the, for that reason, in fact, what I mentioned, for example, one file was, was a concurrent work also, right? that considered this problem in the context of software transactional memory, right? So, uh, so maybe hardware transactional memory can help uh, to, for certain corner cases, you know, to, to make sure that you kind of get better performance. Uh, I don't rule out that completely, right? So, but that's not something that I considered, right? Uh, so I would say, uh, yeah, probably, probably it can help in certain cases, but you, uh, if you're really concerned about strict progress guarantees, uh, may not help us much. Mm -hmm. I see. Thank you. So uh, the next question is: What is the best way to check the correctness of these algorithms? Algorithms so that you mentioned. Best... You... Yeah. yeah, I would say that uh, the best way. Uh, I mean this. <laughs> There is uh, academic way to do that and non-academic way to do that, right? So right. there is definitely in an academic way you want to uh, do, uh, uh, you know, you want to go to each block and prove that this is uh, this part is uh, linearizable, this part is log-free or weight-free, right? So you go and prove it for each block, uh, or at least have some sort of uh, sketch of this proof, right? If not, uh, if your proof is not that formal, you maybe have still have some idea that uh, can be convincing to the reader, right? But um, but I guess uh, in practical terms, the way that I would tr usually try to do that, at least when I try to write this algorithm, so I'm trying to you know to I'm trying to really uh, find a mistake in this algorithm. I'm trying to say, okay, is this really true, right? That this uh, that this loop is always bounded, right? Or this loop is uh, you know. Because sometimes we look at this 
we really think, yeah, it's probably bounded, but there is some minor mistake that may get into the algorithm, uh, which we didn't take into account. Uh, or, you know, there is some minor detail of hardware implementation that may also be a problem. For example, uh, was, was one example would be just, I can give you one example from practice is that um, uh, log free stack, like very simple data structure, such as tribal log free stack, you can easily make a mistake there uh, if you increment tags uh, when recycling elements. Because you don't need to increment tag on uh, for push. You only need to increment it for pop. But the problem arises if you uh, read uh, uh, this variable uh, using uh, using like uh, just two move instructions. So, so you read the tag initially, and then you read the pointer. So for initial iteration, you effectively have sort of uh, not completely atomic read, which doesn't completely read 16 bytes atomically. You only read eight bytes atomically at a time. So in this for initial iteration, if it, let's say it succeeds for this inter initial iteration and you don't increment a tag, you may end up in a situation where the stack is corrupted. Maybe not in all cases, but in some rare, extreme, extremely rare cases, right? So this is why when I present this example, I also incremented the stack so that in case if somebody tries to implement, it doesn't make this mistake. So it's better, so it's better to be on the safe side to actually increment tag there, even though it's not strictly guaranteed uh, it's not strictly grand, uh, it's not strictly required if you read atomically. You can still read atomically use companion exchange, uh, but uh, using companion exchange 16 bytes. But sometimes you don't want to do that, and you know this is where uh, things get tricky. So I think you also have to take into account hardware uh, implementations sometimes and hardware limitations. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Um, in 2019, last year in one of the session in the conference was with Lampard who created TLA Plus. And the question is, can TLA Plus help to check correctness of all these uh, series of algorithms? Are you familiar well, with I did, Well, I would yeah. say I, uh, I haven't tried that yet, right? So I have, I have to admit, right? I haven't tried that yet, right? So maybe it's possible, but you know, I really need to investigate that, right? That would be an interesting, uh, you know, that would be a really interesting idea. But, you know, I'm more convinced that weight free errors shouldn't have any errors at this point because I kind of went through this algorithm so many times. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, hopefully uh, that algorithm is already uh, doesn't have any errors, right? So, uh, uh, you know, but I'm, at least I have pretty much big confidence in that and there was some formal part of the proof which actually we had in the paper uh, but it's also because as i said you go through the algorithm you're trying to prove that this part is wrong and you know and some some point you converse you say there is nothing wrong here right at this point everything is correct <laughs> um someone uh, pedro uh, wrote mention notice in the chat and I would like to read as is that notice, and I'll, I'll kindly ask you to comment that one. Notice regarding RSU. Note that RSU can be used as a synchronization mechanism to provide weight-free read-only access on data structure, and RSU can also be used as a reclamation scheme. These are two different use cases. Shlam, are you with us? Yes, so I'm reading this question. Yes, so, um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, I, I think, uh, yes, so that's true. But uh, one thing to keep in, mi uh, keep in mind, I think Pedro mentioned that uh, on read-only part, right? So then read-only access. And somebody was asking a question whether RCU is uh, fundamentally the same. And this is a really important point that uh, you still have to solve uh, you don't only have read on you don't have read part you also have some part which modifies right the data structure and this is where uh, you need to additional synchronization mechanisms right in at least in the classical rcu uh, you still have to have some spin lock or in the simple case scenario you may still have some or you may have also some non-blocking data structures there as well but but still uh, but still it's only solves the problem for the read only part right So I guess uh, I guess my maybe I'm a little confused. Is there a question? Is there a specific question here, right? Uh, that yeah. 
that we want to uh, we, we, if we want to uh, like uh, to be answered. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's no any specific question in the chat, and so the next question is more general. For someone who is new in this wonderful world in, of multiprocessing and particular memory reclamation, could you please share any resources that may inspire them? Yes, so definitely a good starting point would be to read, uh, you know, textbooks. Uh, one of them, The Art of Multiprocessor Programming by uh, Kurlithi and uh, Shavit, right? So this is a classical uh, book and, you know, this is a good starting point and a lot of uh, data structures uh, you can find there. And uh, it really has nice, uh, I think, implementations in Java and you can go and check it in Java don't really need to even worry about memory reclamation there, right? Uh, at least for the most part. Uh, so it's really a good starting point. I guess, uh, at least I like that book, right? And when I was a student. Um, so I think another thing is to, uh, I think, read some papers on this topic. Is if you are particularly interested in memory reclamation, uh, that would be, it would be great to read some uh, classical papers such as Schazer pointers, or epoch-based reclamation, uh, um, maybe as well as some more recent papers, uh, which uh, to use some, uh, you know, which either provide some improvements or pre present some newer schemes or have some sort of, uh, you know, mix of different schemes. So this is really, I think, the way to do that uh, as a step-by-step -step process, right? So first you get some knowledge in uh, log free programming in general and concurrent programming in general, right? And then you get to specific topics such as memory reclamation. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, we have a little bit more than eight minutes and I would like to refresh memory that you may ask any questions in our Telegram chat and the link can be found just under the video. Uh, and the next question is, would you mind sharing our motivators motivating factors apart from your occupation that keep you focused as a person, maybe hobbies or philosophies help personally? Well, I think uh, one important thing that I'm trying to keep in mind is that, uh, you know, there's certain topics that are really hot and you want to work on them, right? Because, and there's certain topics that may be very specialized uh, and I specifically, I have that experience in systems, right? Where you work in operating systems and maybe, uh, you know, those ideas that you implement may not necessarily get, uh, get implemented in Windows or Linux anytime soon, right? But still, you want to, uh, you still want to uh, make sure you make some progress and you uh, improve the state of the art because, I mean, this is something that you like to do. And if this is something you like to do, uh, I think this is more important than anything else. Like uh, even if, if, you know, even if I want to, let's say if I want to get more publications, maybe I shouldn't focus on that particular topic. I should focus on some other topic, right? But, you know, there's something that we want to keep in mind that uh, if we really like this topic, we should focus on that as well, right? So this is at least um, my experience, and I'm trying to uh, uh, to kind of follow that path, right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the question from Alexander: Is it needed to implement memory reclamation if use language with garbage collector, like Java or C sharp? Yeah. So it's a good question, right? And one of the one of the reasons why I'm saying it's a good question is because uh, yeah, technically you don't need uh, that, right? You, because you can rely on garbage collection. Uh, but on the other hand, if you look at this problem uh, in a way that uh, that we want to provide progress guarantees, uh, non-blocking progress guarantees, not only for our algorithm but for reclamation for the reclamation scheme itself, then the answer becomes tricky because. Uh, I don't really think there is a uh, weight-free, uh, at least strictly weight-free garbage collector, which would provide uh, bounded mem memory usage as well as uh, strict weight-free progress guarantees uh, as of right now, right? So 
or if it's there, maybe it has some practical limitations, and uh, you know, there is would would not be acceptable in uh, for each every data structure. So in that case, if you really want to imp uh, implement, um, if you really want to have some strict progress guarantees, uh, in that case, even if your language implements a garbage collection, maybe you don't want to use it as uh, sometimes, right? Maybe you still want to use uh, manual memory reclamation. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, the question is, could you compare your work experience in the university as a researcher with your experience as a software developer in the industry? What were advantages and disadvantages? Uh, yeah, it's a, uh, it's a very tricky question. I guess it's a very different experience and uh, in uh, industry the focus is completely on the product, right? So you really, one way or the other, you're always focused on the product and making this product better, right? And maybe you want to implement some good algorithm, uh, but this is specifically in the context of this product or maybe some related products. In academia, it's more open-ended uh, research. So maybe I don't really have any product yet, uh, but I want to uh, expand uh, human knowledge in that area, right? So I really want to uh, present an algorithm. Maybe, I, uh, maybe you know, maybe not too many people yet care about this problem, but uh, you may convince them over the time that, that, you know, this problem is really important and this algorithm is really great. I think this is a very different experience. And this is just one part. Of course, the other part is that in industry, there would be a lot of work uh, you need to do, uh, to do some triaging, you need to fix some bugs, you know, you get some bug reports uh, and all this stuff. Uh, uh, in academia, there would be different, uh, you know, style. You won't probably, you still need to fix bugs, but it's not really done by some, <laughs> by, it's not really done by some other developers, it's really done more informally, right? Uh, but, yeah, you know, there is some other work you need to do, right? So you, you need to uh, work with students. You need to make sure that they make progress. Uh, they, uh, they deliver some results so they can defend their, their thesis and so on, right? So you need to uh, organize their work as well. Yeah, thank you. And regarding your experience and current position as a research assistant professor at Virginia Tech, could you share a little bit more uh, what does it mean exactly? What are you doing every day? And what is your goal and achievement in long term? Yeah, I guess a research assistant professor is a, just a common, uh, uh, it's a, just a common position in US universities where I'm not yet a tenure track assistant professor, uh, but doing some uh, important research work, you uh, basically mentoring some students, uh, you uh, work on some funded projects uh, and so on, right? So and then the, the goal of this step, I, uh, at least at my understanding in U.S. universities, is such that you gain some more experience in uh, research, in, in the research area. So, so by the time you actually apply for a system professor, you have a sufficient number of publications, uh, you have sufficient number of, like a, a significant experience of advising students and, you know, uh, maybe some teaching experience. So at that point, you can uh, kind of go to the next step. And I think it's a, some sort of intermediate step after you complete PhD and uh, go to a system professor, to the system professor position. And it's mostly, uh, I think, required nowadays, uh, at least in computer science. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for answering to that questions. And I would like to refresh memory to audience that my colleagues already shared the link to a Zoom session. And after this communication, after this session, we will have privately Zoom communication and you will be able to ask any additional question that you would like to ask. And feel free to stay with us there too. And thank you, Mr. Nikolai Ruslan, that being with us, thank you for that informative and detailed speech and Seva, please. Yeah, thank you very much for your talk. And uh, as uh, yes, as you saw, as you heard that uh, there is a link to Zoom. Uh, please follow that.
and uh, you can freely ask more questions there. Uh, thank you for support with Q and A, and thank thanks everyone who actually shared their questions in this chat. Uh, we'll see you in the Zoom link then. Bye bye, folks. Bye bye. Thank you. See you.